I got two boys. <laughs> It's it's all it's none of my wife's stuff in the storage unit, which is kind of frustrating because there's nobody to blame but myself. I got wall tents in there and stoves and you know all this hunting and fishing gear and uh, I, it's it's all fun to store it, but I absolutely hate it when it comes time to move it. <laughs> so anybody, we're at the we're at the time we're at the top of the hour. So thanks for joining us here today we got two really special guests two guys that i admire tremendously both super sharp in totally different niches of the market so we'll start off with jeffrey then we'll go to then we'll go then we'll go to jeff then we'll come back to jeffrey and we'll we'll wrap it up with jeff so first things first guys we're in kind of a crazy market do you see do you see the market jeffrey we're in right now is bullish or bearish or do you care or what do you think about what we got here as the broad market? Well, um, you know, the last couple of weeks, it was the early indication we're uh, finished up a correction. Then uh, today, this acceleration down, maybe we're still hunting the bottom or trying to verify that we did make a bottom. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of leaning toward bullish, but I'm cautiously bullish right now. Um, yeah. This, this bottom may or may not be set in stone so far. You know, we had an initial rally. This is the... Uh, the stop out, if you will, you know, this is classic in a bottom where you get a move up and then we go back down and rip everybody and everybody loses hope and faith that uh, the bottom was set. You get stopped out and then you're very skeptical to jump back in and you're sitting there waiting as you watch it rocket off, which I think is coming next. So yeah. uh, we'll see if that actually plays out next week. Now, in a little survey I did with investors this year, it seems like 90 to 99 percent of them missed the rally we had this year. Now you think the uh, market comes down back again, you think they're going to miss it at this next takeoff? I I mean, I I am in belief that we're about to take off again. And uh, despite all the horrible news out there in the worldwide, you know, the economic news, the war, the two war fronts for the U.S. and I guess two for Israel and, you know, whatever, Ukraine, I mean, like it sounds, everything sounds like it's horrible. And I think that's going to cause investors to sit out. Everybody's going to be like, this thing's coming apart. Like we're about to go down the toilet. And if you sit out, you're going to miss out on a very lucrative uh, potential rally that we're about to embark on before we really burn it down. Yeah. So now there's a, a term I talked about before. You, you heard of fear of missing out. Now we got fear of getting in fogey yeah <laughs> it's like october here we are in october 20th we you know, normally october can get a little bit hot but it hasn't really started yet you know text down again this kind of thing kind of wears investors out which yeah you know, if you were going to tell them hey stick around in here we got a rally coming up what, what would you be basing that on mostly tech the dow everything across the board what, what do you think there well um yeah, i'm seeing a huge opex today um, there's a lot of options sitting there holding the market down today. Uh, a lot of rally went right up into these high gamma levels where market makers, uh, particular options market makers, were going to be exposed. And then it got pushed right back down out of that zone. So I think we're trying to clear out some gamma. You know, this is very technical. I think we're trying to clear out what they call gamma in the market and then leave it, leave the runway wide open so those dealers don't get taken when it does go higher. Yep. Um, that's what I see uh, technically. Now, um, as far as what the driver is, I think we've played out AI probably this year. I mean, NVIDIA, like you look at the top stocks for the year, NVIDIA up crushing everybody uh, as far as percent up. That gives it huge opportunity to retrace, uh, maybe some rotation out of that and into some other underperformers. Uh, utilities have been beat down. I'm not saying that's the place where, uh, where we're going to rally next, but uh, there's huge opportunity in utilities for money to flow back into that because it was getting beat down while the S&P was in this correction the last two months. That's not typically what happens. Yeah. And uh, earlier in the season, we saw oil getting beat down while the market was rallying. And then we saw a rotation start out of AI and, and a little bit of big tech into that oil and oil has been popping lately and yeah. oil could be, could lead us up higher. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's working on a breakout again. So yeah. Toward the end of the show here, Jeff is going to wrap it up with some oil. Uh, nobody's better at the commodities game than Jeff. But first, Jeff White, uh, 
Jeff Smith. I want to <laughs> ask you, sorry about that. What uh, what do you see in the broad market, and, and what do you see in the broad commodities market? Um, I'm leaning on Jeffrey's side here. You know the they every time they try to sell this market off, they can't. And that's one thing that I've noticed. The the one thing I think is frustrating for traders out there, and they're in these you no know, big stocks that they'll you know they see a down market, they buy puts and they hold, and they just kind of float there, and their options decay out and they lose money. They try to buy stocks, their options decay out, they lose money. And this is more of a, a premium taker's market as opposed to a, a directional market, unless you're trading intraday, right? So I think that's, that burns out a lot of people. And I, I'm, like I said, I'm going on Jeffrey's side here. I think it's going to put a lot of people on the sidelines and they're going to miss out. And I, I mean, this time of year is usually kind of a bullish time of year anyway, you know, seasonally going up into about the beginning to middle of December. Uh, usually starts right about now. What better time to have us down here toward the lows coming into the middle to the end of you know, October? And I think it's kind of setting itself up to have a nice little push up. You've got, you know, your your crude oil markets. You know, it's kind of interesting. Um, you're kind of talking about that real quickly. There's been more outflows from hedge funds out of the crude market this month. Um, the most since, I think the volume-wise, uh, in barrels was you know, the largest since 2013. Um, they got hung. <laughs> they were betting it to go down. And you know, the Saudis came out and said, nah, don't do that. And look what they did. They hung them. And so they've had to rewrap their you know, thinking around the crude market. And we'll get into more of that later. Yeah. But, <clears throat> but the thing is, is, I mean, looking at you know, the, the commodity markets, you, right now we're coming into the harvest of you no know, corn, soybeans, um, the harvest expectations were dropped by the USDA by about 1%. So on the World Ag Supply last week, you kind of saw them shoot up somewhat. Um, the harvest is actually pretty decent. Um, we've had some nice exports of our wheat. Uh, the, the, we've had an increase in ethanol production, which puts a lot of demand on your corn. Um, and the biggest, pro well, they, they're going to have to see what, now we're coming into harvest. The South America is going to be going into planting, um, and they're going to have to start trying to expect. You know what is you know South America, and especially Brazil, is going to be doing with their soybean and corn markets. Um, right now, the expectation uh, is a bigger crop in soybean, a smaller crop in corn, which might put more demand on our corn and so on and so forth. So um, I'm looking at you know those markets probably floating higher over the next couple of months. Uh, as that little transition kind of comes through. Um, the the one thing that worries me on the metal side of things is, you know, we had a big old spike up. We're back to 2000 on gold, right? So, and silver actually opened the year at 2430. So it's still below its year open. Um, and copper isn't going up with them. Um, copper has actually been selling off. And so you have an industrialized metal, copper, that usually will gauge the strength of economies saying, hey, there's not going to be a lot of demand on copper, so economies are going to be slowing down, where silver is also an industrialized metal, and it's not really agreeing with it. Um, it's actually trying to push up some. So I'm wanting to see copper get back above the 370, 375 area, and I think you're going to get a renewed rise in both gold and silver big time if that happens, uh, especially if silver can get back above its 24, 30-year open. So I think the metals markets are a great place to kind of park money if you're trying to figure out where to put some money in. The GLDs, I would stay away from like GDX, those guys. Um, I think, you know, your 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 pure metals people um, and the actual GLD, SLV uh, probably are going to be performing the best. There's going to be some of the um, the metal, the miners and stuff like that that will do well, but they're kind of been thrown by the wayside here lately for whatever reason. Maybe it's just because it's earnings season. Um, but I concentrate more on just, you know, doing something pure metal wise if you're going to be doing that. So, um, but I think overall, um, I think this is kind of an opportunity to try to, I don't want to say bottom feed, but uh, give it a little time to see if it can prove itself to hold down in here. Yeah. No, uh, one thing that I was fascinated about that you mentioned earlier this year, might even have been last year, 
was uh, you really had your fingers on the pulse of the market there in Ukraine with the wheat talking about I didn't even know what a big wheat producer they were, but oh, yeah. maybe touch on how big of a wheat producer they are. And what's the situation over there with their wheat? Well, the the biggest the problem, with the war? yeah, the biggest problem is that Russia actually allowed them to start exporting their wheat. Um, and then they came in and said, nope, can't do that. And then they said, okay, 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 you can. And then, nope, no, no, you can't. So the wheat guys out there are just going nuts. The, the, the biggest problem that they run into over there, even though we don't, use their wheat or anything like that here in the united states but that feeds all of africa and the middle east and and you know the the far east and stuff like that so they yeah. produce all of that wheat for over that in that region if you look at you know their exports hurting someone you no know, look at africa they're having horrible problems getting food in there and that's one reason and if you just saw the suez canal just raise their rates um so you're trying to get something out of the Black Sea into the Mediterranean down through that Suez Canal over into the Persian Gulf. Well, it just costs you a whole lot more money, right? So yeah. that's going to hurt, I mean, quote unquote, raise their inflation if you want to look at it that way. Um, but that's going to hurt them, you know, just trying to get that out of there. Um, you've got a lot of different commodities. You look at uh, also, they are the largest producer in the world of sunflower seeds, sunflower. Um, so if you're looking for sunflower oil that people put in when they cook and stuff like that, it's going to be harder to get that just because we're going to have no less of that coming out. A lot of it's been destroyed by Russia just from all the rockets and the bombs or whatever else. Then you got to get the actual farmers to get it out and, and down to the ports where you no know, who who knows who owns the ports these days. So it's it's a it's a huge thing over there. I mean, that, you're talking about 11 percent of world production comes out of Ukraine. That's that's a huge thing. So I mean, that's that's one thing that you no, know, I've been kind of you no, know, really kind of worried about as far as you no know, starvation, if you will. A lot of people rely on that wheat and soybean and everything else that comes out of that country. Um, so they're a great you no know, bread basket, if you will, in that part of the world. But uh, I mean, the thing is, is can you know, Australia, South America, U.S. kind of help offset that some. Well, yeah, we can, but we got to eat too. So we're, we'll just have to see how that, that battle comes out. Um, mm -hmm. I think <clears throat> more than anything, you've got soybeans up here at 13 bucks. I mean, you just look at the the, the cost of um, of production, if you will, in the field. You, you're, you're pulling out, you know, basically, you know, somewhere around 74 bushels per acre on on soybean, where you're getting about 173 bushels an acre on corn. Well, that's cool, but you got $5 corn and $13 soybean. So <clears throat> if you're going to be a farmer making money, um, you're going to have to have at least 200 acres of corn, but you only need about 100 acres of soybean to make the same amount. So if you think about that, people are going to be shifting over to the soybean just because they can make more money out of it where this is. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to be wondering if we're not going to be seeing that shift here in the U.S. also. There's been a less demand on ethanol. So why do we need so much corn going to ethanol? So I think you're going to see next year um, probably less acreage in corn and more acreage in soybean and wheat. Yeah, cool. Now, back back to uh, Jeffrey Turnmeyer. Hey, do you see any short selling? What are you thinking about short sell, uh, short squeezes and short selling right now? Oh, well, I mean, it's it's hard to say. Uh, you know, you never know until it actually takes hold. Uh, we do have some record shorts. I, I watch S3 on X or Twitter or whatever it used, whatever they call it these days. Um, S3 partners, they keep a pretty good tab on it. And uh, Tesla has been making the top of that short list. And, uh, and then this big dive on earnings with the uh, the Cybertruck launch maybe not going as smooth as everybody thought it was going to, as far as what the, the rollout plan is. Um, you know, that's that's probably more shorts piling on there. So there may be a huge opportunity if Tesla starts to turn a bottom. And uh we were talking about you know big tech. I think Tesla is positioning themselves to be a tech company, not a car company. And uh, you know, they're getting their North North American charging standard adopted across all the different brands. They're rolling out this new AI humanoid robot called Optimus that they plan to uh, roll out in their factories. And I mean, that's huge short squeeze opportunity in Tesla once it turns a bottom. Um, is that going to be 
in the 200s in the 180s I'm, I'm not sure where the bottom is yet like i said it's hard to hard to see where the squeeze is before it takes shape but, now, do you uh, follow tesla a lot what about this truck it looks like something my eight-year-old granddaughter put together with a <laughs> hey, I, I, I put my money down 100 bucks on that for a day one uh you know order so i've, I've been following it along for a couple of years now uh like i said i have my order in there um uh, i'll be a kidding. buyer yeah, I'm gonna buy one if uh, if I get the chance. <laughs> now, Jeff, Jeff Smith, you would never see a Tesla truck in your neighborhood, would you? Uh, no. I mean, Oklahoma no. and South, those those guys ain't driving no. Yeah. No, you see some <laughs> Teslas around, but you you see more, you know, the good old Ford GMC Ram trucks. And in fact, I think one of the most popular cars around here is a Jeep. Yeah. So, which is crazy being on the Gulf Coast, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Quite popular here too. A lot of Teslas too, but uh, I don't think that Tesla truck is going to fly with these ranchers. You know, it's just but yeah. there's a market for it. I mean, there's a there's a lot of trucks that never see a load in the pickup in the in the bed. You know, um, yeah, there is a lot of I see a lot of Rivian trucks up here, and they got nothing. They're not pulling nothing. Nothing's getting put in them. It's just, uh, yeah, that battery is going to be a, a big issue. And then we got the Ford Lightning, as Uru says. About has anybody seen that Ford Lightning? That's got to put a dent in the Tesla truck just because that truck is so ugly. <laughs> well, the the sales like what what the big deal right now? And um, the interest rates are finally starting to to wane on demand for vehicles. I mean, you look at the cost of a vehicle. Tesla has high margins and they're able to keep reducing their uh, cost of their vehicles, their Model Threes, Ys, Ss. Um, they don't have that Cybertruck out yet, but uh, you know the the Lightning all of a sudden. Here in uh, Q3, demand has plummeted 46%, you know, getting people That's canceling awkward. orders. What is so, up with it? Is the truck so bad they're canceling? <laughs> That's the the high cost and the interest rates um, is from what I've been reading. It's yeah. uh, It just makes it, you know, when you look at the what you're paying, at, it's like Elon said in, in the Tesla call just this week, you know, Wednesday, he said, look, it's not that we've cut our prices for the end users. We've cut our prices for us, but our end users are still having to pay the same amount as before we started doing these price cuts because the interest rates are climbing so high. He's like, we haven't actually given any relief to our customers as far as interest rate payments. He's like, yeah. people that can pay cash, sure. But you know, people that are having to borrow money, there's no discount. So yeah. he's trying to keep people being able to buy their cars, even though the price keeps stepping down. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, that's that's just one place I see an opportunity um, because they've made the top of the shorts list. And Elon is notorious at attacking the shorts when they're short in his stock. Yeah. He, uh, he plays the game very well. <laughs> I got to just be clear. I'm, I'm totally a little bit confused about this. So you do have an order in for the cyber, the Tesla truck? Yeah. And when do they think you might get it? Um. Uh, that's that's the thing. You know, nobody knows. They're having a launch event starting on November thirtieth, is what they announced on Wednesday during the Earth's call. Like straight out of Back to the Future, man, with Doc and <laughs> <laughs> Einstein in the passenger seat. I can just <laughs> roll it down the street, man. That thing works you on one point twenty one gigawatts. <laughs> yeah, I get Lance is getting one. Is Lance getting the truck as well? I, I see Dan popped in here. Lance is getting the truck. That thing is ugly. I hope Lance ain't getting it. I had Lance all talked into buying a Jeep, put the windshield down, the doors off, take the hat off. And I got him some <laughs> World War II goggles. He could just. <laughs> now, this uh, this EV stuff, it takes us right into oil, Jeff, and you're the man on oil. So uh, do you think this EV thing is going to put a dent in in oil demand and then and then just go right into your oil take right now? Because. We got all this Israeli stuff. Also, is that going to that be, is that war going to raise oil prices? And you can never trust the Saudis. You can never trust what they say to do. You never know what they're going to do. How? What's 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 the uh, wild card with the Saudis in there too? Well, the the, I mean, it's kind of a wild card. I'll I'll say that that area over there produces fifty percent of the world oil there. Wow. Um, I think it's like 49.8% if you want to get exact, but it's right about 50%. Um, you've got embargoes that you no know, Iran just came out with against you no know, sending any oil to Israel. You've got 
um, Israel shutting down rigs that are there in the, in the Mediterranean. Um, Chevron actually had one, I think it was the Tamar rig uh, that was there, and they shut it down just because they didn't want it blowing up. Um, you've got a lot of pressure now in that area of, hey, who gets oil and who doesn't? We're on Israel's side, so you think they're going to give us oil? No. So the Saudis are still, I don't want to say they're on our side, but they're not against us yet, so we can still get oil. We're still a net importer of oil. Um, I mean, if you just look at what our exports are, what our imports are, we're still a net importer of oil. Um, our largest people that you know take our oil um really is the netherlands and um and great britain um second in line is you no know, the koreas and or south korea and china um they're the second one to take our oil so we still have a a net debit when it comes to you know import exports on it um i'm i'm still kind of scratching my head a little bit why we want to export our oil especially when we got two wars going on um, but that's totally up to them. Um, the, the, another thing that we're running into, I mean, our strategic oil reserve right now is half what it should be. Um, everybody says it's depleted. It's not depleted, but it is half. Um, they said they were going to be buying oil when we were down at 70. It went down to what, 65, 66. They didn't buy it then. Now they have an order out there, you know, at 80 bucks. Um, if it gets down there back down to 80, they're going to get it. Well, notice what crude oil did. Um, and here, let me share my screen. Just have fun. Why not? Yeah. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. A comment on the export import. Um, our our refining capacity is designed for a different oil type than what we actually produce here. That is correct. They, and, they do heavy and sour oils mainly. And, and, uh, and yeah. there's less environmental restrictions on refining the oil that we produce in other countries. So we ship it out, export it to those countries that can refine it. And uh, our refineries aren't designed for it and don't meet the re environmental regulations for it. It's kind of a weird game that way. Uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to export our oil. But then again, um, it's the environment that our government has created by yeah. permitting. <laughs> well, and, and that's another thing that um, I mean, even the, the refiners here on the Gulf Coast, some of them have actually started increasing capacity for the light sweet crudes, um, which is good. So we can do more, but still, they're still geared for the heavy and they're still, you know, for the sour crude oil. Um, and if you ever want to know what sour crude is, it's got a lot of, you know, sulfur in it. Uh, and that's why you have on the diesel side, ultra low sulfur diesel. Um, that's what they call heating oil. Um, and in natural gas, that can be actually turned into H2SO4, which if you don't know what that is, that's called sulfuric acid. So um, it can be very, very, very corrosive. So, and, and this, this right here is a, a day's, daily chart of crude is a continuous contract. One thing I thought was interesting is you'll notice that they won't get back below 80 now. So they won't just let it get down to where, you know, they want to start buying their crude. Um, and they did the same thing when they said they're going to be buying it here down here at 70. Well, they had more than an off opportunity to do so, and they didn't. So to fill the strategic oil reserve. So they're still keeping supplies low. Um, our refining capacity has dropped off tremendously over the past five, 10 years. So we, the, 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 the thing is, is what people don't realize. I mean, we, yeah, we have to use crude oil to make a ton of stuff. We don't quote unquote use crude day to day in our lives. We use distillates of that. We use gasolines. We use oil. I mean, like no, the oil for your car, which is all synthetic anyway, we use all kinds of different things. We have lubricants for our cars and things of that sort, but we just don't go out and buy, you know, a barrel of crude oil and say, well, I can use this in my backyard or something like that. So the, the thing is, is the demand on crude there to make the distillates. That's the biggest thing. And so I always watch gasoline inventories and gasoline production, uh, just as Jeffrey was pointing out here. Um, and the reason for that is, is because if you have a whole a lot of demand on distillates, then you're going to have the demand on crude. You can have all the crude oil in the world that you want, but if there's no demand on gasoline, crude's going to dump off. I mean, I mean, you can have very, very little crude oil, and if there's no demand on gasoline, crude's going to dump off just because of the, the demand on it. So even though we have increased supplies, decreased supplies of crude oil, the big question is, do we have increased supplies, decreased supplies of the distillates? 
And that's the one thing that, you know, the EIA petroleum status report, everybody looks at the crude oil part of it. They never look at the rest of the report. It's only a one page report. I mean, come on, read it. But the thing is, is that you got to look at that distillate and the distillate production and the gasoline production. And they'll actually tell you the capacity rates of those refineries also. Um, if we can stay above the 90, 92, we're doing fine. If we drop down to 88, 87, 86, we're not producing as much as that we need. Um, and that's why I like to watch those capacity rates. And I think what you've got going on now with all the unrest that's going on over there with our decreased production here, the biggest question is, is our economy, looking at the jobs report it is, um, still moving along? If it is, if there's still a big demand, which we had one of our largest demands this month so far in gasoline, we should have crude and gasoline moving higher, which we've seen that. Um, gasoline was down at you no know, 219 a gallon. It's up at 240 a gallon now. This is over just the past couple of weeks. Um, we've had crude that was down around that 82, 83 area pushing against 90. We got a lot of resistance around the 90, 50 to 92 area on crude. You can kind of see just looking at this chart, just you know, we'll strike a line here real quickly, um, just for fun. But just you know, right here in this area, you've got you no. Know, a lot of support that was now it's become resistance and they're going to have to try to bust that and really get above 95 bucks. You've been hearing people, you know, scream and yell about hundred, hundred and fifty dollar crude oil. Ah, eh, maybe, but they're going to have to get above that to make it really work. Do they come up here and they fail again? Do we go back down? It all depends on demand. So I'm really expecting crude to move higher, to be honest with you. Um, I think there's a, enough, um, pressure out there globally, um, especially if you get China, you know, moving their economy back up um, and uh, get the, you know, the, the Asian areas um, with a, a greater demand, I think we're going to see crude oil try to push back up to probably around the 100 to 105 area. Um, now, that's going to be kind of a longer term trade. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. But I think that when we start looking at you know, our, our productions, I mean, you've seen even in natural gas, uh, natural gas was up around nine bucks and it got hammered um, just because, you know, the, the, the European Union, you know, had that pipeline, they got blown up and all this good stuff and they put a lot of demand on it. Well, they found out last year um, that they had kind of a warm winter, they didn't need as much natural gas. Plus they started getting gas other places so we had a decreased demand on our gas and therefore it dropped off. And of course we had pro no horrible problems getting you know, uh, the LNG out of our ports and everything like that. It was just a mess. Um, now um, we've got our normal little rise in natural gas that we usually see between August and you know, uh, October. Everybody's you know, kind of gearing up for you know, the cold winters. Right now I wouldn't be touching natural gas. It's going to be probably correcting down for the next probably several weeks. That's normal as well. Now we get to see what the winter is going to be like. When we start getting nor'easters and get some of those nasty winter storms like we saw last year, you'll see natural gas probably pop back up. I wouldn't expect it to get much above five, but right now it's you know, around 320. So I think it's still got some move to go. Um, another thing, just speaking of that real quickly, if you're interested in trading natural gas futures, which I do not recommend because it is very, very expensive, um, they're actually coming out with a micro contract on that on the 5th of, of November. Um, so it's going to be one tenth of contract. So instead of controlling 10,000 no know, BTUs, it controls 1,000. So it's going to be one tenth. Um, but I think you'll probably see a lot of people trading that contract as time goes on just because there's not as much risk in it. And they've done it with the mini S&P and crude. And I mean, look at the margins, the overnight margins on all those contracts right now, they're outrageous. Um, you can get that by one tenth by trying trading those micros. So um, plus you have a lot less risk on them. And I think the exchange was pretty smart in doing that, but uh, the micro crude is you no know, doing real well. Even the options on the micro crude and stuff like that is actually perked up a little bit. But I think if we can get above this 9092 area, I think you'll see crude end up taking off. I'd be surprised if we got back below 80. Um, and one, one thing that's really interested in about this little sell-off that you see here, crude opened up right around like 8050. I think it was 8057 for the year. So they came right back to that year open, said, ah, nice little pictures, took pictures of it, flipped it back around, and they started moving it back up again. 
So that's one thing that I think we'll probably continue to see going into the end of the year is crude continue to kind of just slowly kind of push on higher. You might, I mean, every week you're going to get an EIA petroleum status report, which is going to move things around a little bit. Uh, this last one, we had you no know, big draws in crude and gasoline. So they kind of pushed things up some more. And I think that demand is still going to be out there. I think people are still going to be you know, cruising around town because um, they don't have a Tesla truck. They're going to have to buy gas. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that's just the way it is. So um, I think they're, you're going to continue to kind of see these things probably pressing higher. And I think it'll be really good to, I mean, to be on the, the, the positive side of gold and the positive side of crude. I think those two markets, those two areas in the market are something that we can kind of to see uh, continue to move higher. Every time you have uncertainty globally, you're going to see gold and silver move up. That's just the way they do things. So, um, but crude oil is kind of its own animal. And right now we've got a lot of decrease uh, export, maybe I should say no more than no decrease in production, even though OPEC has decreased production just to buoy the price, you know, the price of crude. Um, you think of Saudi Arabia, they're, they live off of crude. That's the only thing that they produce over there. So um, as long as they can keep the price of crude up, they're going to be a lot happier. And if they can get it back above 100, they're going to be real happy. So yeah. um, it's going to be hurting us, though, just because our pockets are going to be kind of getting beat up a little bit. Yeah. So, now I want to come back to that oil thing. But first, I want to ask Jeffrey again, if you see the market rallying again and coming back, and a lot of people are looking for a bull run here what would be the first things that lead it if somebody wanted to take an early nibble when stuff went back up what do you think is going to start off first well um you know i commonly hold that uh things that have held up really well uh like your big talk big tech that hasn't flushed uh google's been holding up really well amazon's been holding up really well um you know even microsoft and amazon been holding up really well walmart's been holding up really well uh, you know, a lot of these are probably going to outperform on the next leg higher. Yeah. Things that are sitting there at their 52 week lows, they're probably not going to do so well. Things that are at their 52 week highs, they're probably going to take advantage of this into the end of the year. I mean, we've already got, you know, 75% of the year behind us, almost 80%. And, uh, you know, it's already told us what's going to be the, the leaders for the, toward the end of the year. You know, it's just a matter of who's, who's in first, second, third. So, um, you know, yeah. follow the leaders, you know, pull up the year to date chart or, the you know, a graph of a, a tool that shows you what's up year to date. The things that are absolutely the top, they're probably not going to, you know, they're they're the ones everybody's gunning for. You know, be careful. Your, your NVIDIA, your Tesla, you know, they're going to get hit a little bit more than likely. Now, the stuff that's right near the top, that's probably going to hang in there. You know, look for your secretariat, as uh, you said the other day, you know. Uh, you're one that's just a little bit behind that can come up and, and lead the pack into the end of the year. Those are the ones you want to be looking for. Um, stuff that's right near their 52 week highs. That's, that's cool. probably the stuff that's going to be leading us into the end of the year. You know, even really. Intel's held up pretty well. Intel yeah. has held up pretty well. Well, TSM last night during their earnings call saying that uh, they they're seeing orders pick up. That's not reflected in their balance sheet yet, but they're actually seeing a turn in the market. The demand is starting to, to turn the bottom. So they're actually looking up into the new year, into the fourth quarter, and the, and into the new year. So no, chips could be outperforming here. Yeah. Uh, well, are you talking about Tyson or Taiwan Semiconductor? Uh, TS, TSM, Mike. Oh, M. Okay, Ty not M. Taiwan Semi. Okay. <laughs> TSM well, is Tyson. <laughs> TSM, Mike. Okay. My southern accent there. <laughs> now, now, Jeff Smith, you got a little something for the, the folks at home, I understand, regarding... I which is like oil is the thing right now. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the drummer for the whole marching band right now. So oh. lay it on us, Daddy. So um, <clears throat> what we've uh, kind of put together here, let me just kind of go through these a little bit. Of course, last night, um, if you all were watching any kind of TV whatsoever, you saw our president on air. Um, of course, he addressed the nation from the Oval Office second time since he's been in office. He's done that. Um, and he's encouraged Congress to commit, you know, 74 billion up to 105 billion on the ungoing efforts in Ukraine and Israel. So, and of course, with regards to what you think of these decisions, um, we do have to acknowledge the underlying reality. 
these conflicts in oil rich regions are uh, they're not going to go away anytime soon um i don't see these wars if you will or skirmishes um just no ending in the next week or two or three i think we're going to probably be seeing these for months and even he said last night that he looks for them to be extended so and of course while we hope for peace uh, we need to be aware of the massive impact you know this is having um, we've already seen the oil markets move up i just showed you a chart we kind of corrected back down we bounced back up so and even since you no know, last weekend we've seen a nice move up from around 84 dollars in crude up to right at 90. so i think this is going to continue to kind of move on um, and i think like i said it's just the beginning i think we're going to continue to move on up um 31.3 percent of the world's oil supply is in the middle east just in that one little area but you start including uh various others in there in ukraine and russia um that's nearly half of what we we're doing that's what i was mentioning earlier um and uh, this is all between those war-torn areas. So, and this is going to you know, create some opportunities for us, you know, of course, if you know what to look at. And that's why we put together um, a report yesterday. Um, it's called the three oil stocks to watch during the current crisis. Um, we've taken time to detail out what's going on in the conflict and you know, drag down the broader market and heat up the oil sector. Uh, I think that a lot of the uncertainty that we've seen, we've seen the market correct down on that. Um, but is it really a, a bear market yet? Uh, my argument is no. But we have listed three stocks that we'll be watching closely, you know, looking for really a, a breakout opportunity, especially if crew can start breaking out. Um, there might be a bonus in there just because I don't like the number three. <laughs> and so we we'll, might throw another one in there just to make things nice and even. Um, and Tom and I want to get this out to you all um, and put it in your hands as quickly as possible. You have the weekend to kind of check it out. Um, so today for you guys, we're going to give it to you for five bucks. Um, that's back, basically $1.25 a ticker if you want to look at it that way. But uh, it's a really easy read report. Explains why we're looking at the stocks that we're looking at. Um, and kind of gives you an overall feel for what the overall markets are doing in the energy sector. Uh, we want it to end soon. Of course, everybody does, um, but there's no sign that it's going to. But in the meantime, we can be, you know, do the responsible thing, prepare our portfolios uh, for the potential fallout. So, <clears throat> but this report is designed to help you do exactly that, just to kind of help you on your portfolio side saying, hey, what stocks are going to be moving up based off of you know, this move in crude? So if you want to go to dtitrader.com slash oil, you can get your copy today. It's five bucks. It's a nice little weekend read. Um, and that way you can get a better feel for what stocks are probably going to be your hotter ones that are out there um, on this move. Um, you can look at ETFs. You can look at various stocks. Uh, the one problem I always have is, you know, on just an equity itself, uh, they have CEOs and they have you no know, earnings and stuff. Um, so these are a little more resilient in those areas, but I think, uh, it'll be really interesting to kind of go through it and get the, an insight and maybe you'll find other things as well. Uh, there are a lot of bullish things when it comes to the energy markets. Um, you know, I've always liked, uh, you know, trading pioneer natural resources and they got bought out. Now I'm sad, but, <laughs> um, but now you no know, Exxon owns them now. So we'll just see what they do. Right. So. You but, see a lot of consolidation in in that too. Are these yeah. stocks are they following along on that uh, on that theme of you know total consolidations? Like these little guys are going out. Well, they are, and I think the the bigger guys are they're actually trying to prepare themselves. I I I I think in the back of their mind, and this is oil guys always look way out to the future. They always do. They never just say, "Hey, what's going to be happening here." I mean, if you go look at just the, the volume on the crude oil contracts, you can go to December 10 years out and there's volume on those contracts. And it's kind of crazy. So they always kind of look out to the future. And I think they're going to, they're arguing right now is that the oil sector is going to start perking back up again. You're seeing a lot of, um, even Europe is starting to shun EV. Um, they're, I mean, they're pulling back on the, the the green energy stuff because they're finding out it's not helping them as much as they need 
and they're going to have to start getting into more of the fossil fuels. And I think um, there's going to be a broader uh, push on that. And I think there's going to be more demand on it. Like I said, I think this is going to be a nice little ride up for an extended period of time, as opposed to just you know, making it a day trade. Yeah. So we turn my, do you follow oil and do you think it's going higher? Uh, I mean, it has the chance to break out right now. The micro time frame, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit of a coin flip until we break higher. Uh, we could get a little bit of correction back in, down to that 85 area one more time. But uh, if we do break out, we're probably heading on up, retest the prior high. And then if we get above that, it could be 108, 100, possibly 110 on the upside. I'm long oil, just so everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, i'm not hiding it I, I i think it's going higher and both of these guys on here folks are brilliant and uh, thank you jeff for this this book on the top three oil stocks everybody ought to go get this you know this is about the price of a gallon of gas right now up here so i think this is a great deal for everybody and you kind of got to get a, a grasp of what's happening with oil because that's such a big player i mean it it drives everything I was watching uh, Powell talk about how oil is is causing inflation, you know, through through every other product that's made with oil, derivatives, cosmetics, plastics, the whole nine yards. Yards. It's like that one thing is is really the stickler with inflation. And now with this global situation, yeah, this looks like where you got to be for right now. So thanks for putting that book. You bet. But uh, it's it's basically one gallon of gas to get it, and. Uh have at it so. yeah good stuff i'm always surprised you know you'd think in this ev age that uh, oil would just kind of go by the wayside and you hear about all the ev sales picking up but uh it just isn't happening it's just oil is just so embedded into the fabric of of everything of our life that uh you know it's more than just one little thing can put a dent in it by the okay. way buddy ask it i would never in a million years buy an ev put just because i hate the way they sound <laughs> I, 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 I have a i got a pretty good friend that's a tesla mechanic he's a mobile mechanic at the tesla dealer here in town and uh he said you'd be surprised how many gallons of oil is actually in a tesla no doubt he's like, you, got, you got gear oil you got grease you got all these things he's like you'd be surprised how many gallons of oil it actually takes to operate one of these evs dodge has a has an ev charger or something like that and, and now they got a, a sound thing in the back that may, you flip this little switch. It sounds just like it's a gas engine. <laughs> I mean, why would you get an electric charger? You can't hear anything. You know, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's, forget that. So they got a little switch you flip and it sounds like a real car. How funny is that? But when you get yours, Jeffrey Turnmeyer, you got to <laughs> drive the thing around. You got to have it on the show. Uh, we <laughs> Jeff Jeff Smith in the back of it with a couple <laughs> of hay, and uh, maybe you pull in some cows or something. Uh, <laughs> hey, right now, I drive a twenty-year-old Avalanche. So <laughs> you go. I drive an eighteen-year-old Toyota. <laughs> awesome. Hey, so that's it for today. Unless anybody's got any questions, pop them in the chat. Amish country, I don't think you're going to see an EV in Amish country. Yet. <laughs> but go get that book, dtitrader.com forward slash oil. Today probably be a great day to read that and get yourself set up for next week. And then remember, Jeffrey gave you the tips on what's going to run first. And we got this oil book for you today. So uh, that's good stuff all the way around. Thank you guys for being on here. Thank you. Good to see you, Jack. Yeah. Great session, Craig Craddock. All right, thanks again. I hope I can host again next time, but it'll, we'll be back with our regular host, Celeste, and uh, she'll do another great job next week. Adios, amigos. Get the Bye, book. everybody. You'll be glad you did. Stay warm <laughs> up there, Jack. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>